This is the last lecture in Chapter 14, and this lecture is about calculating the equilibrium constant K when you don't know the equilibrium concentrations of all of the products and reactants. So if you know the equilibrium concentrations of products, I'm laughing because my dogs are rolling around. Okay, let's see, over products and reactants. If you know those concentrations, it's just a matter of plugging and chugging, right? And so we've done some of that. What happens if you don't know the equilibrium concentrations? There's something you can do, and we call it, chemists call it an ice table. Um, it involves some math, and it will often allow you to calculate KEQ. So let's take a look at that. I think it's easiest to teach you by using an example. So let's look at a simple example here. And the information you're given in this problem is at equilibrium. So for example, a typical plug and chug problem would be that you're given the equilibrium reaction and you're given the equilibrium concentrations of the products and the reactants. And then you simply, as long as you write the correct equilibrium expression, and remember that coefficients become exponents, and it's just simply a matter of plugging in the correct concentrations and then calculating. Remember that K is unitless, by the way. All right, so now what happens if, for example, all we have are values that might be able to be plugged into Q, some type of concentration that maybe initial concentrations, um, is there any way to get to equilibrium concentrations? Yes. So I mentioned an ice table. Here it is. It gets its name because there are three sets of values that we try to calculate in this table. There's the initial concentrations the amount they're changed by. This change row is determined by the stoichiometry and the balanced chemical equation. So remember that, that's important. And then finally, the equilibrium concentrations, which are the concentrations that are used to determine the equilibrium constant. So this is what a typical table looks like. Um, it's a good idea to write the chemical equation itself at the top. Um, then go ahead and write your ICE. We usually don't write out the whole words. And then write a column under each reactant and each product that you can put your values in. So initial stands for initial concentrations. Change again, you'll see that we get from the balanced chemical reaction, the coefficients. And then finally, the equilibrium concentrations are determined by adding together the initial and change values. They, they give you the initial, or I mean the equilibrium values. All right, so here's an example. It's probably easiest to teach this by um, going through an actual example. So really simple reaction here, the decomposition of molecular bromine into um, individual bromine atoms. So, which occurs at a whopping temperature of 1,280 degrees Celsius. So, usually, if you have to um, use an ice table, you need to be given at least the equilibrium constant at the particular temperature you're talking about. Remember that equilibrium constant changes with temperature, so watch out for that. So, and then the initial concentrations of the reactant, bromine, and of the product are given. So let's go ahead and fill in everything we possibly can in our ice table. Here's the ice table. Here's the reaction at the top. And what are we given? We're given the initial concentrations of bromine, which is 0.063. We're given the initial concentration of bromine atom, which is 0.012. Now, we don't know right off the top what the change in concentration is going to be as the this reactant and product reach equilibrium, but we do know 
how much change there's going to be um, of bromine, com bromine molecule compared to bromine atom. How do we know that? Well, look at the balanced reaction. There is one bromine molecule that is decomposed to form two bromine atoms. So there's a mole ratio of one to two. That mole ratio needs to be maintained in the change row of an ice table. So what this is saying is for every one, and X, we use X because we don't know what the value is yet, for every one bromine molecule that disappears, two bromine atoms are formed. Pay attention to the minus and the plus sign because they become important. Things that are disappearing, typically reactants, have a minus sign, just kind of like our rate laws. And products or things that are increasing in value have a positive sign. That's important because after you determine what X values you're going to use for change, you then add together the initial plus the change rows to get your equilibrium values. So as you can see, it's just 0.063, My, there was a minus sign here, I'm defacing it, minus X, that is the equilibrium concentration of bromine molecule, and 0.012 plus 2X is the equilibrium value of bromine atom. So what do we do with these equilibrium values? The same thing we do with all equilibrium values. We write an equilibrium expression for the balanced reaction, and that would be concentration of bromine atom squared because it is coefficient divided by concentration of molecular bromine. Now we plug these equilibrium values into the equation for equilibrium and um, we're all set. So here's showing all the math. Here's the whoopsie daisy. Here's the expression for the equilibrium constant. I have plugged the equilibrium values in. Be really careful. You see here that the atom, uh, an atom of bromine is squared, so I have to put the entire expression for the equilibrium concentration of bromine atoms and then make sure you square it, which can get rather hairy mathematically. Um, we were given the value for the equilibrium constant, and that allows us to solve for x. So, of course, anytime you have x and then a square value, you're going to end up with a binomial. Um, so when you write this all out, this is what you get, and you simplify it, guess what? You need to remember how to use the quadratic equation. So that's something that I would go ahead and give you on the test, but um, you need to re-familiarize yourself with it. So you need to first, just a reminder, when you're using the quadratic equation, you need to get all of the, everything over to the left side of the equation and then so that on the right side of the equation is zero. Once you do that, the coefficient that's in front of x squared is called a. The coefficient in front of the x factor is called b. And the coefficient without an x factor is called c. And then here's the quadratic. When you do that, you always get two possible solutions for x. One of them will make sense, and one of them will not make sense. One of the possible values for x is negative 0 0.0105 molar. Well, whatever equals x. And so 2 times that is negative 0 0.0210. When we combine that with 0 0.012, we get a value of negative 0 0.009, which is impossible. You can't have a negative molarity value. So that can't possibly be the correct answer. The other possible value for x was 0 0.00, 
one, seven, eight. And so let's see, two times that would be Oh, that's a negative two, actually. Okay, negative 0 0.00356. If we combine that with 0 0.012, we get a reasonable value of 0 0.00844 molar. So that is the correct answer for X. Um, and, of course, we do the similar thing trying to solve for the concentration of molecular bromine equilibrium. It is 0 0.063. We now know that X is minus 0 0.00178. Look carefully at the equilibrium expression for the concentration of molecular bromine. There's already a minus there. So minus and minus make a positive, so I'm actually going to add 0 0.00178 to 0 0.063. Okay, so the final concentration, equilibrium concentration of molecular bromine is 0 0.06478. And so that's your first introduction to how an ice table works. I promise you, even though that may seem ridiculously complicated at this point, you will get so used to making ice tables that you will um, be doing them in your head before long. Just to let you know, a big portion of the next unit continues to be equilibrium with ice tables, special types of equilibrium, so it's really important that you get the skill down and you understand it. So let's do another example. The reaction we're talking about here it's another decomposition, okay? Um, and let's see, I usually write initial amounts right under the balanced equation. It just kind of helps me visualize. So be careful because in an ice table you want concentrations and you will occasionally come across problems that rather than giving you direct concentrations, give you moles and liters. So it does need to be in concentration. So one mole divided by 10 liters equals 0 0.10 molarity. So I go ahead and place the concentration values below where they belong. And we know the equilibrium concentration of I2. So we don't know the initial concentrations, but we know the equilibrium concentration of I2. I2 is 0 0.020 molar. So as soon as you kind of can visualize and have an idea what's going on, go ahead and set up your ice table, plug in what you know, and um, we'll determine what um, the X values that we're going to use. So as I said before, start by writing your balanced equation at the very top of your ice table. Um, set up your ICE values. Remember that we know the initial concentration of hydrogen iodide and we know the equilibrium concentration of molecular iodine. Now, in the beginning, if the only initial concentration you're given is reactant, then you can assume the product amounts are zero. That's very common. That's actually commonly how a chemist will carry out a reaction. They don't add products to begin with. They add usually just reactants. So a lot of times you'll be finding yourself writing zero for the initial concentration of products. And what you're trying to find are the equilibrium concentrations of everything. I want you to look at this table for a minute if you're not totally baffled at this point. And there is a way, if you're given this information, if you're given at least one equilibrium concentration, to figure out what the other equilibrium values are without using X values. So if you think you can do that, go ahead and give it a try. Otherwise, move on to the next page. All righty. What I want you to notice is you don't have to use X because you know the initial concentration of one of the substances as well as the equilibrium concentration of the same substance. 
Remember that you add the first two rows together to get equilibrium concentration. So we can find we can determine that the change for molecular iodine is 0.02 molar. And once you have the change for any of the substances in a reaction, you can quickly and easily figure out the change for all of the other substances. Remember, all the change values follow the stoichiometry of the balanced equation. So looking at this equation, if the change in molecular iodide is point, iodine is 0.02, and that is understood to have a coefficient of 1 in front of it, that means the change for molecular hydrogen is identical because they have a 1 to 1 mole ratio. However, there is a 1 to 2 mole ratio for hydrogen and iodine compared to hydrogen iodide. So that means that twice as much hydrogen iodide will disappear. So it will be minus because it's decreasing. It's a reactant, 0.04, all right? So we know all the change values, and now you simply carry out the math. 0.1 minus, because it's decreasing, 0.04 means the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen iodide is 0.06. 0 plus 0.02 and 0 plus 0.02. Now, you would fully expect the equilibrium concentration of these two products, hydrogen and iodine, to be equal to one another, just like they are, because they form in a 1 to 1 mole ratio. So now, as always, we go back to our equilibrium expression and we plug in the equilibrium values we just found. Again, please watch out for exponents and remember to leave pure liquids and solids out of the equilibrium expression. So we plug in our equilibrium values, do the math, and we find that the equilibrium constant for this reaction at this temperature is 0.11. Um, that's an example of a reaction where neither products or reactants are favored. So any type of K value that is greater than, let's say, 0.1 or less than 10 is considered that the concentration of products is about equal to the concentration of reactants. All right, so here's one I really want you to try on your own. So go ahead and turn the video off. See if you can, if, at a minimum, you should be able to write the equilibrium expression and set up your ice table. And then I'll go over it on the next page. We already know the um, balanced equation that was given to us. But I want you to start out by writing the equilibrium expression for a reaction. So in this case, equilibrium constant, concentration of the products, divided by concentration of the reactants. And all of the products and reactants have a coefficient of 1 in front of them, so we don't have any exponents other than 1 for our concentrations. The problem did give us the value for the equilibrium constant at the temperature it's working, and that was 0 0.50. Equilibrium constants are unitless. All right, so now we're going to make an ice table, and... We're going to have to use X's in this case because they didn't give us any equilibrium concentrations, only initial. And then we're going to come back and fill in the expressions we got for the reactants and products in terms of X into here and solve for X, kind of like we did with the first example. All right. So here we go. The problem gave us the initial concentration of carbon monoxide and the initial concentration of hydrogen. As I said previously, unless you're told otherwise, you assume the initial concentration of the products is zero. Okay. Now, since your balanced reaction, since all the reactants and products all have a 1 to 1 to 1 molar ratio, we're going to call all of their change x. Remember that the reactants are decreasing, so they have a minus sign in front of them. The amount of product is increasing, so it has a plus in front of it. Add up the first and second um, numbers in the first and second row, 
and you get the equilibrium expressions for the reactants and the product. Now we'll go back to our expression for KEQ and plug in these values and solve for X. Alrighty, here is the expression for equilibrium. Remember they gave us the value for equilibrium constant. This is simply just plugging the equilibrium concentration values into the expression. We get this. Now you've got to cross multiply and do quite a bit of simplifying um, to solve for x. And just like we had to for the first sample problem, uh, we have to find which of the two solutions given from a quadratic formula make sense. And so you have to go back, plug in to your equilibrium values, plug in the values, both values of x to see which one gives you an answer that makes sense. So 0 0.028 minus 0 0.0018 gives a reasonable value, okay? We've, it's, it's reduced, but it's not negative, which is an impossible situation. On the other hand, 0 0.028 minus 2.165, that's taken away more than we had to give to begin with. So a negative molarity is impossible. So we now know that the answer for x is 0 0.0018. And therefore we find the equilibrium concentrations of the reactants and the products right here in this first column. That's it. I hope you're getting just a little bit more comfortable with ice tables. There is a way to double check yourself once you get the equilibrium concentrations. If you were given the K equilibrium constant value, which we were, remember in the beginning of the problem they said it was 0 0.50. Well, if you just to make sure you did your math right, if you plug in the equilibrium concentration values that you just calculated from the ice table, and if you plug them into the equilibrium expression and get a value for K that's very close to what was given, that means that you did um, your math correctly. Now, this is a very important last couple of slides because this is how most of our ice table problems will be done. They are much more simple. They, um, you make some simplifying assumptions that allow you to avoid using the quadratic formula to get rid of that x squared term. So it's a really good tool, but there are only certain, certain circumstances under which you can make these simplifying assumptions, and you need to understand what they are. So um, if you have a k value that is very small, so that means that its exponent is negative, first of all, and then I'd say either negative 3 or even smaller, which would be negative 4, negative 5, etc. So this is a very small k value. What does a small k value mean? It means it doesn't make much product. That reaction doesn't make much product, okay? Doesn't, doesn't happen very extensively. So in the next page, I'm going to tell you what that means. So in this case, it would specifically mean that not very much dinitrogen tetroxide is made at all. The vast, vast, vast majority, like way over 99% of this equilibrium mixture under these conditions will be nitrogen dioxide. If we go through and make our ice table like we have all the other samples, so we start out with the given equilibrium concentration. Now, this problem is important also because if you don't remember from before, the pressure, if you're dealing with a gas, is directly proportional to concentration. So pressure can be treated just like concentration can. Um, and so if you, in this case, we have gases and you're given the concentrations in pressure form. So go ahead and just use the pressures in the ice table. It's perfectly fine. So you start with three atmosphere pressure of nitrogen dioxide. As always, unless you're told otherwise, assume the concentration or pressure of the product is zero. 
pay attention to the stoichiometry of the balanced equation. Uh, it's 2NO2 for 1N2O4, so that's understood to be 1X, okay? Um, the NO2, the reactant, is decreasing, so there's a negative sign. The product is increasing or building up, so there's a positive sign. When you add rows 1 and 2 together, these are the expressions you get for equilibrium concentrations. So we're going to go ahead and plug those values into the equilibrium expression. These P's are just pressure. And so, of course, equilibrium concentration or pressure for N2O4 is simply X. And the equilibrium concentration for NO2 is 3 minus 2X. So normally you'd have to cross multiply, multiply, simplify, um, use a quadratic. But listen very carefully. You can make a simplifying assumption in this case. Look at the value of 3, and our simplifying assumption is going to be to neglect any x factor that is subtracted from a relatively large number. So how do we know if 2x, for example, is a lot smaller than 3? Well, what does x represent? It represents the amount of N2O4 that is formed. Is there very much N2O4 formed? No, as a matter of fact, uh, there's like 0. .000000, .000, almost none formed because this K value is so small. Okay, so that means almost no product is formed. In those cases where K is very small and our starting amount is relatively large, we can neglect the x value that is subtracted or added, and that'll simplify the math tremendously. Now, I've had students off and on say, well, can I just neglect the x by itself? No, because if you do that, uh, you're going to end up with a zero. When we say neglect x, we're saying that the x is zero. So if we said x is zero here, the problem would be done. So you can only neglect x's that are um, subtracted or added to a relatively larger number. Okay, so let's go ahead and finish that up. Now, with x out of the equation, we simply end up with the following quite simple math equation. So that simplifies k equals x over, and 3 squared is 9. Okay, and then the k value, which they gave us, Easy schmeasy. Multiply both sides by 9, and you get a final answer or x value of 8.4 times 10 to the minus 6. That x value is what would have gone in here. So that verifies that our assumption that this x is negligible, that's a, that was a good assumption to make. Because what if we tried to do this math? If we had 3, and we subtracted from 3, 8.4 times 10 to the minus 6. What does that look like? Let's see. 1, 2, 4, 5, 8, 4. See? It's such a little number compared to the 3 that it would be inconsequential. So that was a valid assumption neglecting x. So for 99% of our problems, they, you will be able to neglect x, but you've got to always look at it and make that decision. Go ahead and read what I have at the very bottom of the slide. Um, the bottom line is um, that if you take the x value you solve for and you divide it by the number you would have subtracted it from, if that ratio is less than or equal to 5, it was okay to neglect and cross out x. That is it for Chapter 14, Equilibrium.